All right, God's beautiful nature around us. God and the Skeptics, Part 1, Seven Skeptical Doubts. Uh, part 2 is going to be seven positive reasons that uh, we ought to believe in Christianity. This is doubting the doubters, giving the doubters something to doubt. And uh, then we'll be showing positive reasons why we should believe. But part one, seven skeptical doubts. We're up doubt number five, and that is a loving God could not send people to hell. Could not. How brazen is that? Hartmut, there's a, there's a good German name for you, graduate student from Germany said, I doubt the existence of a judgmental God who requires blood to pacify his wrath. Someone had to die before the Christian God would pardon us. Why can't he just forgive? And then there's all those places in the Old Testament where God commands that people be slaughtered. Josie, who works in an art gallery in Soho, all that is troubling, yeah, I agree, but I have even more of a problem with the doctrine of hell. The only God that is believable to me is a God of love. The Bible's God is no more than a primitive deity who must be appeased with pain and suffering. And this in answer to an email of young New Yorkers in their mid-twenties. So, um, uh, and I carry on with this. Others have formulated the argument that Christians believe some people will go to hell because they are essentially worth less than Christians. What, a, what an amazingly wrong view. They think the Christian concept... Uh, is a God who judges and sends to hell. This, they say, leads to exclusion, abuse, division, and even violence. These attitudes reveal to us at least three false beliefs, and we'll try to deal with those as uh, succinctly as I can. Number one, the argument is a God of judgment simply cannot exist. Um, just this pronouncement, a God of judgment simply cannot exist. You know, America was once known for its rugged, independent spirit. We don't see that a whole lot anymore. Uh, that's because the FBI will come knock on your door and say, what are you up to, if you're thinking independently? Um, people would examine the news, come to their own conclusion about what's happening and what should be done. But this individualism, as laudable as it might be, tends to cause people to hold religious beliefs based on their own conscience. Well, I just examine the religions and I choose the best one for me. Our modern culture then has no problem with a God of love, what they consider to be a God of love, but doubts a God who will judge those who have wrong but sincerely held beliefs. Most of the world thinks that you're okay as long as whatever you believe, you believe it sincerely. Uh, nobody stops to think that that would be the only place that that would be true. I mean, you go blindly to the medicine cabinet at night and pick out a medicine and take it when you, you're sincere about wanting to get that medicine, you see. But you end up taking the wrong thing. So let me point out the arguments. And with this, you have the opportunity with the uh, worksheet and if you didn't get a, a, a bulletin, please get that now or raise your hand and somebody will get that to you. Anybody not, not get a... Nancy. All right. Glad to have you back, Nancy. Um, the, the music is much better. Somebody run and get her a, a, a bulletin with the uh, insert. And uh, so I have left it blank to encourage you to fill in the blank. So under the word notice or next to the word notice. And... Olivia is working very hard, getting it fast, and uh, coming back. And here she is. All right, let's give her a hand. Well done. I appreciate that. All right, thank you. All right, um, a god of judgment simply cannot exist. Well, let's notice that this argument is completely cultural and personal in its condemnation. This is seeming to be a universal statement. But the person who says this is representing a very small portion of the world's population. Completely cultural and personal in its condemnation. I would say this, it's only the Western culture, Western Europe, Western 
the United States, uh, uh, the United States as the West, that has decreed that a God of judgment is wrong. To other cultures, it is not judgment, but forgiveness that's contrary to common sense. Forgiving? No, 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 you see. To turn the other cheek is unthinkable in some cultures. The vendettas, the, the, the turn, you know, giving back is, is the common thinking. Judgment makes very good sense. So our, it, we would say to the person who says this, are we to arrogantly suppose our Western culture is superior to all others in attitudes of what God should and shouldn't do? In, in the end result, this is just an opinion of what you think God should do and what he shouldn't do. That's big of you to tell God what to do, right? Um, but, uh, so you're comfortable in, in this uh, sweet Western thing. There can't be any God of judgment when the rest of the world doesn't agree. The Bible reveals that neither the heart of man nor his culture invented these beliefs. What we're finding is that God says that he will judge the wrong. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, figuring that we just worked this out, some philosophy that we have. It is not the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The point we want to mention here is that the writers of Scripture are emphasizing they didn't make this up. They didn't come to this as a logical conclusion. God showed this to them. This is the word of God. And then again in 2 Peter 1.16, Peter says, no, no, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. A fable is, is a story that's told for a purpose, for a moral purpose, you know. He said, we didn't come up with this because we think this is a good way to teach. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I think that he's talking especially about Christ's majesty when he was with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw him transform. He, he turned into this nightlight Christ and just started glowing and shining. And, and then Moses and Elijah came to visit him. And somehow in the spirit, they, the disciples knew who they were. They weren't wearing big name tags or anything. Um, but somehow in the spirit, you, you connect spirit to spirit and know who these people are. He says, I saw that. I was, I was an eyewitness. I was there. This is true. So God himself delivered these facts about himself to us because God is beyond our senses, beyond our ability to know him. We can't just go have an afternoon tea with him. See? Um, he is beyond us. He revealed to us that he will judge the living and the dead in the time to come. This is something that he says, I will do. To Timothy, Paul wrote, 2 Timothy 4, 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ who shall judge the quick, meaning the living, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. The judgment is coming, and living or dying won't let you escape this. You'll stand before Jesus Christ and be judged. Now, if this belief attacks the culture that we have created around us, then we should beware, since he knows the future as surely as a man might know the past. Do you remember what you did yesterday? I hope you do. Well, the thing is, you know what you did. God knows what the future will be, just as sure, just as unchangeable as you know what happened in the past. But I want you to recognize this, that in this, and, and what's missing in this argument, is that um, Christianity does not belittle people who have other beliefs. We're not here to make fun or to condemn them because they believe something wrong. Rather, we pity them and want to see them saved by understanding and believing in the gospel truth. Our attitude is not a superior attitude belittling those people, but 
a heart of compassion to see them saved. And this is not a civil rights type of thing. Christians do not consider the unsaved second-class citizens. Salvation comes from the grace of God and not from our superior wisdom or actions. We're not superior because we came up with this. We were among the unsaved, you see. We were there. We got changed. So we're sharing what God has said. A second argument that we hear is the God of judgment cannot be a God of love. A God of judgment cannot be a God of love. The two things are, are essentially contradictory, they think. So I would say that some people have difficulty in connecting what they call God being a God of love and what they call God being a God of judgment because this is really misunderstanding both sides. We'll try to deal with that. <laughs> they imagine that a God of love must what? Forgive and accept everyone. He could not get angry if he is love. Now, this is just false thinking. So let me give you notice number one. Underline this. Put this on the underline. All loving persons are sometimes filled with anger. And not, not accidentally, but they are filled with anger because of their love. Dedicated love sometimes demands anger. Suppose a person you love is being hurt by someone else or being hurt even by himself, like in addiction and so on. You become angry not in spite of your love, but because of your love. You think of a parent's settled anger against the cancer that's eating away his child. This does not contradict his love. You see how it works? Because you love, you hate what hurts your loved one. Now, God created his law out of a desire for what is best for man. Sometimes people just think of God's law as something God put together by a resident attorney or something is that I got to tell him something but no God devised this and sin this thing is a transgression of God's law so what we understand then sin is the essence of what is wrong for man as well as by man when God looks at sin when you and I look at sin in our life and in others we ought to say, oh, this is so bad for them. This is so bad for them. If I could just urge them to get out of it, to conquer it, this would be so much better for them. Psalm 145, verse 17 and 20. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. This, this righteousness speaks about his attitude toward the law that he has given holy, separate from everything that's not according to that law in all his works. And then in verse 20, the Lord preserveth all of them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. So God in his holiness will destroy the wicked, those who maintain their wickedness. This is the thing we need to, to grasp, that um, uh, all loving persons are sometimes filled with anger. Uh, a man whose wife is hurt or a mother whose child is hurt. These people are angry with what hurt them. All right, the second notice and the second underline here is believing a person will be judged, as I do, does not restrain Christians from urging them to reconciliation. We are not despising people because they will be judged. We are urging them to be reconciled to the judge. We are asking them to, be, to consider how to be reconciled to the God who will judge them. You see, that's the attitude. We're not uh, minimalizing these people, marginalizing them. We're seeking them out. From the Bible standpoint, 
if God were not angry at injustice and sin, Christians would not need to reconcile men to God. There would be no problem. If God was okay with everybody, then, hey, just everybody do whatever they want. Who cares? But we find this in the Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, as if God were here talking to you, and we're in his place. And what does he say? Be ye reconciled to God. Who needs reconciled? Enemies, you see. People with a, uh, with a problem with one another. They need to be reconciled. They need to be made friends. The animosity needs to be taken away. And this is God's plan. This is our plan that he gave to us. We become the ambassadors. So this is not a, a, a judgment against people because we think they're less than something. We're, we're actively act, asking them to be reconciled. We recognize this, that Christians have come from the ranks of the unsaved. None of us were born Christians. People that think they're born Christians aren't Christians. I'm sorry. We see men in their danger precisely because as in Psalm 711, God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. This is why we're concerned. The attitude, I think, was pretty well expressed in the hymn, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship by George Atkins. Askins. We sing this. Brethren, see poor sinners around you slumbering on the brink, on the cliff edge of woe. One turn and they fall off. Death is coming. Hell is moving. Can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. So how expressive is this, you see? Here's our attitude. This isn't a condemnation attitude. You rascals who just don't believe like we do. Go away. No, oh, this is concern. And then the third thing I want you to write in is this. Number three, most of the world accepts the idea of judgment to stop violence. Most of the world accepts the idea of judgment to stop violence. And if you look at it, uh, all this talk about the Old Testament where God is destroying people and so on, judging people. Uh, considering how widespread sin is, how widespread uh, the uh, animosity between man and God is, the judgments are very few. In fact, you study it and you find out that the only time that God brings active judgment to groups in this world is when they are hurting his own people, when his loved ones are being hurt. This is why he says when he, he comes to Abraham talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, the cry, the cry has come to me in heaven. Uh, where did the cry come from? Well, the, his own children being hurt there, being persecuted. And he said, I've come to take care of those people that are hurting my, my, my kids. When a man's house is burned or his family violated, he desires judgment and justice. In fact, you see, the world pretty much takes this stuff in their own hands, but it's the Christian's assurance that God will mete out proper judgment that gives the Christian the ability to restrain from personal vengeance. Why don't we go take care of those people ourselves? That's not our job. Not given to us. Here's what he says, Romans 12, 18 and 19. He says, now, it, if it be possible, this doesn't mean that it might not be possible for you. It means to the extent of your ability, to the ultimate extent that you can do this. He says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Then he explains, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, 
do not take revenge, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, God saying, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We say, I could misinterpret and give too much vengeance because I don't know the whole facts. Or I might be so limited that I couldn't give enough vengeance because I'm powerless. But God says, I will know completely what needs to be done and I will do it to the fullest. Just let me handle that. Parents have said that to their children. You know, It's not up to you to smack your brother or sister when they do something wrong. You just come to me. I'll take care of it. Not your job. All right? Now we come to the third wrong statement, and that is a loving God would not allow hell. It's just too bad, too much, too, too mean. This argument misunderstands both the Bible view of God's love, being who he is, and the punishment of hell. So I have to cover both of these fairly quickly. So I want you to notice, first of all, let's look at God's love. God's love is defined by his nature, not man's. For the most part, the concept of love is misunderstood by the world. Uh, we are dominated by what is called the romantic concept of love. And that word from the romance comes from, uh, ultimately from the word Rome. And uh, the, the romance languages are the uh, languages that came from, from the Roman language, the Latin language. And um, the idea of uh, the story of romantic love is that the beautiful man, the beautiful woman, are stunned by each other and they, they must, must have each other and it's love at first sight and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and that uh, love must be, must be satisfied. Go by your heart. And this is all the romantic stuff. But God's version of love is, I love this person so I will seek to meet their needs to the best that I can, even if it costs me to do it. God so loved the world that he wanted to kiss it. No, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's love from God's point of view. That's the agape love. That is the charity of the New Testament. God's love is defined by his nature, not man's. Let me point out to you then how God's love is dominant. The commandments are all defined as acting in love. Acting in love. That fulfills the law. Jesus explained, Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Jesus said unto him, the one who asked the question, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So what is it? Love the Lord thy God. Then he says, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love the Lord thy God, love thy neighbor as thyself. The first two greatest of the commandments that summarize all the rest. And then he adds on verse 40. On these two commandments hang... And this is the word, that it's, it's a present tense continuing thing, passive, is being derived. All the, uh, from these two commandments are derived all the law and the prophets. Now this is, this is a stunning revelation. This means that as God sees it, all of the laws, all of the laws of the Old Testament and the prophets who, who focused back on the law, all of these came from the concept of loving God and loving your neighbor. You could open up uh, Leviticus at random and point to, to a, a thing about what, when to gather sticks, you know, and whatever. 
And if you understand it correctly, you'll understand it's explaining how to love God or to love your fellow man. Because from the, from it's like a, a mobile, you know, that you have love, and from it comes to love God, love man. And hanging from these in perfect balance are all the laws that talk about loving God, all the laws that talk about loving your neighbor. Therefore, God's idea of love is what? Is acting in all points according to his law. To conceive of a love that simply dismisses wrong is to invent a kind of love that God cannot have. God is the greatest good. So following God follows the greatest good, doing the best. Turning from God is taking the path of destruction. To say a loving God would not allow hell is to misunderstand what that's all about. Um, hell is the end result of taking the path of destruction. Consider that the only religious text in the world that tells us that God created the world out of love is the Bible. 1 John 4, 8 and 16. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. If you know anything about God, you're going to have to imitate something of that love. Verse 16. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. There's a consequence. That he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Your participation in the love of God comes from the fact that God is love. This is a defining term. Uh, this is noun and noun. God is love, not just that he is holy. That would, if, if it were the same with holiness, it would be God is holiness. But it doesn't say God is holiness. It says God is love, not just loving or lovely. lovely. He is love. That's his character. So the very concept of God being a God of love is a Christian concept and Christian alone. So for them to say that a God of love cannot um, uh, allow hell is to usurp the authority to define what a loving God is and what he does, what he can and cannot do. You don't have the right to make that statement. You can believe it. You can say it. It's just that you have no right to tell me about it. The second notice I want you to look at and write down for me here is notice number two. A person goes to hell because of his own choice. Our Calvinistic friends say, no, God chooses who he wants to come to heaven and the rest he sends to hell. That's God's choice. The Bible says something different. Man goes to hell because of his own choice. For God to change that would be for God to take away free choice. If he took away free choice, then he would not receive love. Man would just robotically do what God programmed him to do. But that's not what he asked for. He asked for love. Love the Lord thy God. Love thy neighbor. That's, that's what God asks. A person goes to hell because of his own choice. Hell is the absence of everything that God offers. What is hell? Absence of everything that God offers. Every good and every perfect gift cometh from above. Everything that's good, that's enjoyable in this life, has come from God. Away from God is destruction. Moving toward God brings into your life three things. Light and life and love. Light, life, and love. 
Alienating yourself from God brings the opposite, darkness, death, and despair. In your life, wherever you happen to be, as you move toward God, you'll be moving toward light and life and love. Wherever you are moving away from him will bring darkness and death and despair, growing darkness, death, and despair. As heaven is the final fulfillment of life, light, light, life, and love, so hell is the final fulfillment of darkness, death, and despair. Outer darkness, eternal death, with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the action of despair, grinding the teeth. Despair. C.S. Lewis was not a theologian, but he had a nice way of saying what it was that he did say, and when he says the truth, it's a good thing to quote. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Problem of Pain, says this. There are only two kinds of people. Those who say, thy will be done to God. Or those to whom God, in the end, says, thy will be done. Either man says to God, thy will be done, or God says to them, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. It would be a punishment. But hell is, I'm here because this is what I chose. That's what makes hell all the worse. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. We see this in the scripture, by the way, that those who seek will find. Those that are, are pursuing God will find him. God opens those doors to the people that are looking. Let me close with this. Number three, notice number three. Hell is eternal because the sin of man is infinite. You say, I just a just a little sin. It's not what you think the sin was, it was who did you sin against? Who did you sin against? David, called Israel's sweet psalmist, understood about sin. You remember what he did. He lusted after a woman. She happened to be the wife of his good friend, Uriah the Hittite, one of his mighty men of valor. And he sent, when she got pregnant, he sent Uriah off to get killed with specific orders to the, uh, to the leader to send him up and then back everybody else off until he gets killed. So, lust, adultery, murder, sin against Bathsheba, sin against Uriah the Hittite, sin against Israel because he was the king. But here's what he said, Psalm 51, 4. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. He says, and it comes down to it, I sinned against you, God. Let me just run you through this. If you were to sin against me, you would have to put up with me pouting. Ah, such a, such a judgment. If you sin against the highway police, you have to pay a ticket. If you sin against the President of the United States, you go to prison for treason. You see the pattern, depending on the power of the person. But since sin is against God, and God is infinite, all <clears throat> sin bears an infinite penalty an infinite consequence. Let that settle in. 
every sin you do is a sin against God. He is an infinite being, and so it bears an infinite penalty, an infinite consequence. Now here's a phrase that I thought sounded funny after I put it together, but I didn't intend it in any sense of humor. Man cannot justly think that God is unjust in his justice. Since he, God, to save mankind, sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty for man's sin. There's no injustice about this. He said, you deserve this. Christ said, I did not come to condemn the world. But the world was already condemned. I come to offer salvation. We were born on our way to hell. We were born lost in sin. And to that extent, not even our fault. We've cooperated with our sinful nature, but, uh, but having it in the first place wasn't our fault. So he said, I will send my son. He will die in their place. That if they choose him, they can be saved. Here's the, dare I say, the math of it. Christ, as eternal God, could die once and pay an infinite price, that price that we owe. Christ would only have to die once. But what about us? What if we choose to pay for it ourselves? If we reject the salvation of Christ, if we reject the substitution that Christ made for us, I'll just take care of it myself. Well, we are finite man. We must endure an infinite price by infinite duration of time in hell. Somebody said, well, why if I commit 10,000 sins, why isn't 10,000 years enough? Because it's not about the sin, it's who you sinned against. The infinite God. must have an infinite price. The only way we can pay an infinite price is by duration of time. And so men go to hell because they choose against God. Jeb Porter said he had this vision. It wasn't a holy vision, it was just an image in his mind that Jesus Christ is sitting at a table with the sinner and he says, please just accept me as your savior. Choose to love what I give you. Choose to want to be a child of God. And the sinner says, no, no, I don't want to have anything to do with it. You just, you just leave me alone. And Christ gets up and walks away. But as he starts walking away, the room gets a little darker. And the room gets a little colder. And he stops and he turns and he pleads with him again. Please, it would be so much better for you if you were just to receive Christ. Change the core of your life. No, I said, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And as Christ turns and walks to the door, the darkness and the coldness increase until finally it's blackness and death and despair. And this is man choosing hell, finding this place at the end of the universe where God can close a door and never think of him again. The God of love says I must act against sin which is hurting those that I love and those who choose it over me must bear those consequences let's pray Father we ask that you might help us to recognize that the world may set up 
false standards, borrow those standards from Christianity, and then try to think they are involved in some form of truth, some form of logic. But to begin with a falsehood will urge uh, only a logical continuation of that falsehood. Father, there are people that are justifying themselves, excusing themselves because they have bought the lie that you, a God of love, could not send anyone to hell. And yet you yourself have said, I can and I must, for sin is contrary to my very nature. I ask, Father, that you might help us then to have that sense of woe, that sense of loss, where Christ was willing to come and to live as a human being, to experience life as we understand it, and to die for us, that we might have a way of escape. I pray, Father, that if there's one here that never has received Christ as personal Savior, has never chosen to love you, that today they will. They will recognize that you have revealed yourself to be a God of love, but that love is dedicated to protecting your own children, those who have come to you, and you will punish those who attack that. And finally, all sin must be dealt with, must be excluded from true existence. Father, we ask that you might help us not to kill ourselves despite our religious attacks. With head bowed, eyes closed, it may be you're saying, Pastor, I need to make a decision for Christ. I need to accept the loving God who warns us that if we do not accept him, we are accepting darkness and death and despair. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be that. I don't want that to be part of me. I want to make sure that I have what God has provided for me. If there is one with a doubt, if there's one that says I would like to know for sure that if I were to die today, I would go to heaven to be with the Lord, would you just slip your hand up and say, pray for me. In fact, whoever can hear this message, wherever you are, I wonder if before God you would raise a hand and say, Please save me for Jesus Christ's sake. Let me receive the salvation that he died to provide. Father, we ask that you might help us then to bear the compassion of Christ, to recognize there is a hell that will swallow up and, as it were, dissolve people as if they were never existed, as if they're Life was just a pretense. They will count nothing for now and eternity. We pray that you might help them to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We pray thy blessing upon us all in Jesus' name. Amen.